Good morning and welcome virtually to Old Dominion University and its remote, remote experience for young engineers and scientists program. Known as Reyes, my name is Mady Wilson and I'm the Senior Administrative Assistant for Strategic Communication and Marketing. And I will serve as your host and moderator for today's session, Orkagami, which featuring Ms. Suzanne Peterson. The purpose of the Global Reyes program is to offer a free virtual learning experience that increases science literacy inspire and train future generations of STEM age students. Today's discussion with our special guests offers a deep dive into the beauty and splendor of orchid. We, she will also teach you about the art of ochre, uh, orchid gami. Throughout the session, you may submit questions through the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Following the presentations, we will answer as many of your questions as possible and as times allows. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Suzanne, would you please turn on your microphone and video so we can see you? Hi, can you see me? Yes. Okay, hi so, everyone. So please join us in welcoming Suzanne Peterson. She is the Community Outreach Coordinator and Artist Educator for Barry Art Museum at Old Dominion, Old Dominion University. Welcome to Reyes, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of Barry Art Museum. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you our incredible exhibition and some programming that we've developed around this exhibition. So today, as Mady um, explained, I will be um, showing you some of the splendor of orchids from the scientific side to the artistic side. We're gonna start since it's early in the morning uh, here where I am, it's 10 o'clock, and we are gonna start with a little bit of yoga. So this is some yoga inspired, um, this is some orchid inspired yoga, my apologies. Um, and it is inspired by a piece of artwork that we will be looking a little bit closer at in just a bit. So this is a piece by David Willis. It's a glass on canvas work. And our incredible yoga instructor, Leah, was very inspired by this work and has developed a whole yoga flow based around this piece of work. So we're going to let Leah take it away for the next 20 to 30 minutes, and then I will jump back on and we will keep going with a tour of the orchid exhibition, which includes 10 artworks inspired by the idea of orchids and their attraction and deception followed by some orchid gami. Um, orchid gami is a play on origami and we will be creating some botanical specimens. Um, so let's get started with the yoga and then we'll move forward with the rest. So I'm gonna share my screen. Make sure you've got your yoga mat and we'll get started. Welcome to Art Inspired Yoga at the Barry Art Museum. My name is Leah of Rise and Shine. This flow, we highlight David Willis's Phalaenopsis Trader Joe Exotica. This glass fruit painting is inspired from an orchid from Trader Joe's, elevating the quotidian flower to fine art. If you enjoy programming such as this, look into becoming a member of the Barry Art Museum. We would love to have to have you. Now on to the yoga portion. We have David Willis's work to my left here. When you're ready, take a seat on your mat. Sitting up nice and tall, rooted through your sits bones. Shoulders are... on the audio. I don't hear anything. And when you laugh, um, 
Yes, we hear it. Know what's okay, real I'm versus sorry, I what's muted myself. In your thoughts. So if you do the physical act of laughter, eventually you do lighten up and you do laugh. Open your arms, open your chest, cross your opposite arm overhead now. We're going to do a lot of laughter in this piece, being inspired from the humor, the implicit humor that comes from David Willis's art. Big arms open, chest lift up. Good. Shake your arms out. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You can shrug your shoulders, just sort of shaking everything off. Shake the day off. Be here fully. Wiggle it just a little bit. Nice. Bring the soles of your feet to touch. You can flutter your legs like a butterfly, feeling that stretch in your inner thighs. Still rooted through your sits bones. Good. And close your knees together. Swing your legs to the side. Give yourself space to lay down with control. Oh, just kidding. Swoop up. Tuck your chin to your chest. Engage your core, lower down, even lower. Strong core, good. Reach up again, just like that swooping motion. And now, ah, now our back reaches the mat. Laying down here, you can have your hands behind your head, just relaxing. Take a deep breath in, big smile on your face, and laugh. Ah, good. Hug your right knee into your chest, left leg is extended long. Gentle tugs, you're gonna feel a slight opening on your hip flexor. Switch to your left knee coming into your chest now. If the extended leg out is a little too much, you can always keep that leg bent as well. Good, switching legs here. Option to keep the sole of your opposite foot flat on the mat. All right. Now hug both knees into your chest, gently rock side to side, pushing the small of your back down against the mat. You're gonna feel a nice massage on your back here. Extend your right leg up, point your right toe, flex your foot, point and flex. Warming up our ankles. Other foot now, left foot comes up. Good, and now both feet together. Big ankle circles, showing love and attention to our feet and ankles. Hug your knees into your chest again, gently rock side to side. Keep breathing through this. <sighs> Think happy thoughts. <laughs> Knowing if you rock too hard one way, you can always rock back. Grab your heels now. You're gonna feel more of a stretch in your arms and shoulders since it's a further reach down. And if you can't quite reach your heels, no worries. You can use a towel or just grab at your shins again. From here, switch to happy baby. Spread your legs, soles of your feet come to the ceiling, rocking side to side, pushing the small of your back into the mat. Kick into your hands, pull down your feet, feeling that opposition and that nice release in your back. Happy babies, we are. And good, rebend your knees, let your soles of your feet come to touch, coming to Supta Baddha Konasana. Relax your shoulder blades down your back. All right, one hand comes on your heart, one hand on your belly. Really settle into this posture. And exhale, bring your knees back together, hugging both knees into your chest, rock and roll spine, coming up, warming up your back. Eventually coming up to seated, let your legs come through. Yoga moonwalk it back to tabletop. Keep your wrists, elbows, and shoulders nicely stacked. Drop your belly, cow. You can look back and look back. Exhale here to cat. Good. Drop your belly, cow. Look over your left, look over your right. Kind of wiggling out your hips there. Arch your back, cat. Drop your belly, cow. Again, look to the right. Look to the left, feeling that nice release in your hips. And arch your back to cat. Big toes come to touch. Lower down onto your forearms and then bring it to child's pose. If your forehead doesn't meet the mat here, you can put your a block underneath your forehead or make fists with your pillows with your fist. All right, tent your fingertips up, having some energy coming through your wrist all the way to your fingertips.
All right, gently rocking side to side, feeling how that changes the sensation in your upper back and shoulders. All right, slide your hands closer down to your knees and gently push up, knees come together. Now we are seated here in hero's posture. You might feel a strong stretch in the front of your ankles. So see how this feels for you. So get nice and tall, inhale, arms come overhead, look up to the ceiling, look up to the sky, and exhale, hands at heart center. All right, shake it out again. Add a little laughter if that feels right for you. Coming back to tabletop. Inhale, right arm comes up, left arm is your base. Thread the needle, bring your right ear and right shoulder down to the ground, keeping your hips high. You can bend your right arm here and give yourself a little pat on the back. Good. Extend your right arm out in front now. Extend your left leg behind you, working on some balance and some core. Really push through the top of your right leg here for helping you balance. Left arm is stacked, wrist, elbow, shoulders. Opposite arm now, left arm comes up, left ear and shoulder come to the ground like the mat is telling you a juicy secret. Bend your left elbow, give yourself a pat on the back. Right arm is a nice base here. Feel this slight opening in your shoulders and upper back. Come back to tabletop, extend your right leg out straight behind you. Left arm comes out, push through the top of your left foot this time. Push through your right palm. Keep your neck down so your neck and spine are aligned. Feel your core helping stabilize you. Good, and drop your hands and knees. Come back to tabletop. Wiggle your hips, look behind, look behind. Nice, tuck your toes under now and sit back, bring your hips back to your heels. Feel that opening and that, that sensation in the arches of your feet. If you can go further, sit up, just like we did in hero's posture, okay? While we're here, might as well stretch out our wrists, interlock your fingers, gently make figure eights here and go the other way for balance. I know that this foot stretch can be really big. So if you need to go in and out of it, feel free. All right, untuck your toes. Windshield wiper your feet there. Little pat, pat, pat. Tuck your toes under. Lift your knees about an inch or two off the ground and shoot your hips up. First down dog of class. Adjust yourself. Maybe you have to walk your hands out further. Push evenly through your palms. Pedaling out your down dog this first one of class. Let your gaze be in between your ankles. No need to cock your neck up. Inhale, lift your heels as high as you can, feeling that nice stretch. And exhale, let your heels come down. Almost windshield wipering your heels now, just playing with this, right? Bend your knees deeply and send your heels to the mat. Lift your heels again, send your heels back down, feeling the stretch and lengthening in your hamstrings. Heels come up, pedaling it out. Bend both knees and then hop, hop, hop. Bring your feet to the front of the mat. Exhale, forward fold. Grab opposite elbow and rag doll here. You can always have a nice bend in your knee. If your back begins to hurt, that's a nice cue from your body to bend your knees. Now rocking side to side, letting your arms go, painting rainbows. Good. Come to stillness, bend your knees so deeply, roll up one vertebra at a time. Standing up nice and tall here in mountain. Inhale, arms come overhead, extended mountain pose. Exhale, forward fold. Making sure our feet are two fist lengths apart. Inhale, halfway lift, nice flat back. Elongating yourself through the crown of your head, relaxing your shoulder blades down. Exhale, forward fold, plant your palms. Step your left foot back, right foot stays in front. Left hand is planted. Twist your right arm up to the sky, staying rooted through your left hand, but lifted through your right. Right hand comes behind you, shake someone's hand. And right arm comes back, framing your foot. Lower your left knee, untuck your left toe. Shift your hips back, half split. If you have blocks, this is my favorite posture to use blocks with. Flex your right foot here. Keep a slight bend in your right knee. Your hips are stacked over your left knee here, so we're not sitting back. Good, keep your chest and collarbones lifted. Hinge forward from your hips, gradually melting your heart closer to your shin. And then you can round out your back here. 
let yourself just drape over your leg. Enjoying that hamstring stretch on your right side. Good. Toes are still flexed, protecting your knee joint. And carefully rebend into your right leg. Plant your palms, tuck your left toes under, lift your left knee. Good. So from runner's lunge, you're going to bend your left knee deeply and hop your left foot to meet your right. And you're here in forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift, flat back. Core is engaged. Exhale, release, forward fold. Inhale, swoop your arms overhead, extended mountain pose, look up to the sky. Exhale, dive down, forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, plant your palms. Step your right foot back this time. Hang out here in runner's lunge just for a bit. Plant your right hand. Inhale, twist your left hand up to the sky. Think tall. Wrists, elbows, shoulders are all stacked. One strong line of energy. Good. Reach your left hand behind you. Shake your imaginary friend's hand. <laughs> left hand comes back up to the sky. And then plant your left palm. Lower your right knee. Untuck your right toe. Shift your hips back. Half split on the left side. Again, use your blocks or pillows, whatever you may have available to you. Or nothing at all. Core is engaged. Flex your left toes. Keep a soft bend in your left knee. Relax your shoulder blades down into their sockets. As you fold and hinge from your hips, make sure that your core is still engaged. Super important here. Tuck your chin to your chest. You can round out your spine. Keep breathing. Nice. And re-bend into your left knee. Move your box to the side. Plant your palms. Tuck your right toes under. Lift your right knee. Bend your right knee and hop, hop, hop. Here we are, forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift, feeling it in the hamstrings, and exhale. Swoop your arms up, chair pose. So with our chair posture, it's a good strengthener. Keep your biceps lifted up by your ears, or you can have your hands at heart center. Good, tuck your tailbone down and stand up tall, mountain pose. All right, y'all. Inhale, arms overhead. Exhale, dive down. Forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, plant your palms. Step your left foot back again. Plant your left hand. Reach up, right hand. Twist. Right hand comes back. Shake the hand. Right hand returns. Plant it. Shift back to half split. Moving through this a little faster this second time through. Our body is familiar with this. Our minds are familiar with this. So we can really flow here. From half split, bring your arms back a little bit more and fold down. So your arms are closer to your left knee here. You're going to feel a stretch in your forearms. Good. Carefully rebend into your right knee. Hands come back up towards your right foot. Tuck your left toes under, lift your left knee, and hop forward to pyramid posture. So your left toes are turned about 45 degrees outward. Your right leg is as straight as it can be. If you feel better with the bend in your right leg, do so. Bring your forehead as close to your shin as possible. You can use blocks here to support you in this very strong hamstring stretch. Again, hinging forward from your hips, keeping as flat a back as possible. I have the block on my back to show we want it to be nice and flat. All right. Again, feel free to take a bend in your knees whenever your body calls for it. Lift onto your left ball of your foot and hop your left foot to meet your right forward fold. Bend your knees, lift your arms and torso up, chair posture. You should be able to wiggle your toes, bring your hands to heart center. You are strong, you are powerful. You are an excellent yogi. All right, hands come down, shake it out. Really working our quads. Inhale, arms extend. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift. Plant your palms. Step your right foot back, left foot in front. Plant your right hand. Twist open with the left, reaching up high to the sky. Shake your friend's hand behind you. Left hand up. Frame your left foot, lower your right knee, untuck your right toe, shift back, half split. Really engage your core here. Keeping you stable through your trunk. 
Nice. And so from here, remove your blocks and walk your hands back. So your fingertips are gonna be behind you facing backwards. This is a slight balanced posture. You're also gonna feel a stretch in your arms. Your fingers can be slightly tented. You could rest your fingers on blocks if that feels better for you. Good, come back, turn your fingertips forward, rebend into your left knee, tuck your right toes under, and lift your right knee, hop, 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 up to pyramid pose. Right toes are at a 45 degree angle. Hips are squared forward. Again, you can keep a slight bend in your left knee if that feels better for you. You can use blocks to bring the earth up to you. Keep your hips squared towards the front of the mat. Even though your foot is turned outward, your hips are still going to the, to the front. In this pyramid pose, we're really stretching out the backs of our legs. So be kind to yourself, take a bend in the knee if need be. All right, lift onto the right ball of your foot and hop to forward fold, bend your knees, rise up, strong chair. Arms are up high, biceps by our ears. Good, exhale, bring your hands to your heart, sink a little lower. And now twist, twist from your core, just twist over. And if your elbow, your left elbow can hook on the outside of your right knee, do so. Look upwards if you like, look down. It's whatever feels best for your neck. Come back to center, arms up high, extended mountain pose, arms down, mountain pose. Inhale, arms up overhead, exhale, squat down, chair posture, weights in your heels again, hands to your heart and twist over to your left. Perhaps your right elbow can hook on to the outside of your left thigh. Keep your chest open as if it's an upward dog, broaden through the collarbones, lift up, open your chest, come back to center, extend your arms overhead, arms come down, mountain pose. Shake it out, lots of strength building. Good job, everyone. Inhale, arms overhead, look up, open your chest, slight back bend, push your hips forward as you look at the wall behind you. Exhale, dive down, forward fold. Hug onto the backs of your calves here with your arms. Gently pull yourself in closer to your thighs so your forehead's coming towards your shins and knees. You can always have a bend here or embrace this really big stretch. Let your arm strength pull you in closer. Good, bend your knees, plant your palms, step back to high plank. Belly is coming in towards your spine, core is engaged. Strong plank here. Good, shift forward a little bit, bend your elbows, chaturanga, lift up to upward facing dog, plant through the palms, push through your palms and the tops of your feet, look forward, feeling that stretch. If you feel a slight pinch in your lower back, come down, exhale, down dog. Hips are up high in the sky, pushing evenly through both palms. Inhale, right leg comes up, three-legged dog, stack your hips, point your right toe, open up, lift onto your left heel, Bend your right knee, good. Plant your left heel, bring your right foot back down. Left foot comes up, three like a dog, point your toe, bend your left knee, lift up on your right heel, really opening your hip flexors here. Extend your left leg, re-square your hips, left leg comes down, back into down dog. Adjust yourself here, maybe your hands come closer. Reach your right hand towards your left ankle, slight twist, Really root through your left palm here. Good. Now plant to your right palm, send your left hand to your right ankle. Look under your arm and replant your left palm. Lift your heels, bend your knees, send your knees back, come back to seated. Feel how that stretch feels now again on the tops of your ankles and the tops of your feet. If you have blocks, feel free to use them here. All right, we are going to work on camel now. So that's a big, big heart opener, a chest opener. Hands come to the small of your back for support. Engage your core muscles, activate them. Look up to the sky, let your throat be exposed. Push your hips forward. Feel that nice chest opener and that slight back bend. Never forcing any posture, going to the point of stretch and growth. Now, if you have blocks, I prefer to use blocks or you can just imagine if you don't have them, you wanna still keep your thighs engaged. So I put the, the block in between my thighs. I'm squeezing my inner thighs together. 
reach back with your right hand, doing a half camel here, or if it's in your practice to do a full camel, do so. Reach your right hand back towards your block or your heel or ankle. So keep your chest lifted, thighs are engaged, good. And come out, sit down, take a little breather. Camel can be a very big posture. Come down to child's pose, recoup. When we think of laughter and lightheartedness, right, it, it's natural to think of your heart. And so in yoga, we're doing this posture to open up our heart chakra more, to maybe let go of things that might be weighing us down. Second side, engage your inner thighs here. Think tall and lifted, even as you're doing the slight back bend, hands come behind your back. Look up to the sky, expose your throat, reach back with your left hand here. Maybe you place it on a block, maybe you place it on your heel or ankle. Push through your hips, send your hips forward. Open up your chest, imagining a light beam shining and emanating from your heart up to the sky. Now gently bring your chin back up. Come out of that half camel, remove the blocks. Physically and figuratively speaking, come down the child's pose now. Rest your forehead down. You did so good with that big heart opener and that slight back bend. Recoup here. Child's pose is a nice restorative posture, giving yourself that space to recoup and rest. Gently push up now. Come back here to tabletop for a beat. Tuck your toes, lift your hips, downward dog. Now we're gonna wave forward into high plank. Keep your elbows in close to your side, chaturanga, lift up, upward facing dog. And exhale, down dog. Inhale, right leg comes up, point your toe, stack your hips, bend your right knee. What a nice hip opener, re-square. Exhale, right knee to nose, step your right foot through. Left heel stays up high, rise up, high crescent lunge. Strong bend in your right knee, place your hands on your hips, bend your left leg, bring your left leg up, lifting your left knee, balancing on your right leg here, going into flamingo. All right, so go ahead and send your right knee down to the ground, grab your left foot with your left hand and balance here. Keeping your knees close together, right hand extends up, thinking like a flamingo balancing on one foot here. Flamingos are fun, yet elegant, just like this piece. Stay lifted and rooted, nice. And release your left leg, send it back, high crescent lunge here. Awesome job, hands come to your heart center. Twist over to your right. Again, twist from the core, not using your arms to help you twist. If you can, hook your left elbow on the outside of your right thigh. Oh, or if you fall, just like I did, get back up. It's okay. <laughs> All right, chest is open. Lift your chest into your sternum, lap it off, and plant your palms. Good, rebend into your left leg, come into pyramid posture one more time. Left toes are turned outward 45 degrees. Right leg is as straight as possible. Head comes down. Lift up, bend your left knee, walk to forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, rise up, extended mountain posture. Slight back bend here. Push your hips forward, nice. Exhale, forward fold, grabbing your calves behind you. And release, plant your palms, step back, high plank. Elbows staying close to your ribs, chaturanga here, upward facing dog, strongly rooted through your palms, so strong. Exhale, down dog. Inhale, left leg comes up, point your left toe, stack your left hips, bend your left knee, bring your heel towards your glute, open up your hip flexors, straighten your left leg, re-square your hips, exhale, left knee to nose, step your left foot through, rise up, high crescent lunge very strongly based and rooted in your left foot here, strong bend in your left knee. Bring your hands to your hips, bend your right knee, walk it up, standing up nice and tall, rooted through your left leg, lift your right knee, grab your right foot with your right hand, keep your knees in close together. 
Good. When you have your balance, extend your left hand up to the sky flamingo posture here. Rooted through your left foot. Inner thighs are engaged. Your knees are close to each other. Good. Hips are squared to the front of the mat. Keep that nice elongated balance. And let your right foot come back, landing in high crescent lunge once again. Hands come to heart center, deep breath in. Exhale, twist over to your left. Again, twisting from your core, not forcing it. If you can, hook your right elbow to the outside of your left knee. Keep your chest lifted. Keep your balance. And if you fall over, no big deal. Laugh it off and come back. Come back to center, plant your palms. Bend your right knee, hop up to pyramid posture. Right toes are out 45 degrees. Left foot is as left leg is as straight as possible. Let the crown of your head come towards the floor. Good. Lift your right heel, bend your right knee, walk to forward fold. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, swoop your arms up. One more chair posture for good measure. <laughs> and stand up tall, cactus your arms, feeling that nice opening in your chest and upper back and shoulders. Hands come down and now to your heart center. Great job, everybody. All right. Go ahead and carefully sit down. Try not to use your hands. It's a good core practice, but if you need to use your hands, it's all good. All right, so you're gonna wanna put a block around your upper back in between your shoulders, if you have a block. If not, you can use a pillow, um, whatever you may have available to you. We just want to keep our chest lifted. It might take some time to adjust and wiggle with this. Never rush a posture either. You get the most out of it when you are properly aligned. So here we are in fish posture. You can place a block under your neck or head if that feels comfortable for you, or you don't need a block there. It's really your preference. Walk your feet as wide as your mat, knock your knees into each other, feeling that nice relief in your hips. Chest is lifted, opening up our heart chakra even more, inviting more laughter, more levity, more humor, more lightheartedness into our days. Bring your soles of your feet to touch. Arms are resting by your side. Nice, keep breathing here. You can place one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly. Check in with yourself. Where might you be able to add some laughter to the day? Great job, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this flow. This is where I will leave you today. Feel free to stay in this posture as long as your day allows. Take a deep breath in and exhale, maybe with a laugh <sighs> or just a nice release. Can't wait to see everyone here at the Barry Art Museum. Take care, everyone. Namaste. All right, everyone, I hope we all enjoyed that. Um, if you did, we actually have a full library of various art inspired yogas put on by our incredible yoga instructor, Leah. We have pieces that are in, or yoga flows that are inspired by glass pieces, by paintings, by changing exhibitions that uh, were once up and are no longer. So you can really dig back into history um, things that we don't even have on display anymore in the museum and really get some good time with them. Um, so if you're interested, go ahead and check out our YouTube page, Barry Art Museum on YouTube. And we have probably about 30 different yoga videos for you to choose from. All right, well, we're gonna be moving along to the next portion of our day today for everything Orchid. And I will be transitioning us over to a tour. So uh, I'll let you take a moment to get yourself um, set and ready. If you were just on the floor um, with that last pose with Leah, you might need just a moment, maybe a sip of water. 
Um, and we are going to get started. So this is the Barry Art Museum Multimedia Tour. And today I'll be obviously showing you our changing exhibition, Orchids, Attraction and Deception. But while we're on this page, I'd like to plug these various tours that we offer. We've got something for just about everyone. So if you are interested in checking out our collection through a specific lens, whether that is through various artists, um, different movements, time periods, or skill sets. We have all different tours to offer to show you different ways to look at pieces of art. We're gonna get closer into orchids here, and let's take a look. Welcome to Orchids, Attraction and Deception. We first start out our exhibition with a few very old reference books. These books are from the late 1700s to early 1800s, and they would have been examples of reference books that scientists and students would use to study various species of plants. Many of these are specific to orchids. We'll take a little closer look at this one in specific. So we are here depicting two smaller books. The one on the left depicts an orange fringed bog orchid which Lisa Wallace, one of our community partners and the professor of botany here at Old Dominion University, her students spend a semester focusing and um, dissecting these orchids. So we have the page turned to that specific species um, kind of as an ode to her. Um, we've got all four books here um, and I just wanna point out exactly how they were made. These are lithographs or a printmaking technique that have each been hand colored. So in a way we can think of these historical books as one of a kind works of art of their own. This larger book in the middle is depicting the bucket orchid as it's commonly known. This orchid is native to Southern Mexico and only blooms for about three days out of the year. When we speak about orchids attraction and deception, specifically deception, this is really a great example of what we mean. Various ways that nature deceives in order to get what it needs. So here we have these plants begging for pollination. They're gorgeous and pollinators will happily land on the plant. But what they don't know, let me actually go back to that book. What the insects don't know as they land on the beautiful petals of this orchid is that there are two small um, veins secreting a very slippery liquid. So as the bee lands on the petal, it actually slips and falls into the bucket. And similar to a Venus flytrap, the plant snaps shut. Instead of killing and eating the bug like a Venus flytrap, this is all in the name of pollination. So the bee wriggles its way out of the bucket and it actually has to emerge from a little hole on the bottom and the back. So it finds its way out, but it takes about 30 minutes, really kind of working very hard to get out of this petal. So once it's emerged, it's completely coated in pollen. It's been, it's been kind of working its way, rubbing right up against the pollen. And so once it is out into the world, it is coated and able to pollinate many flowers. So this species is really tricking its pollinator into doing maybe double the duty that it would typically do. Kind of interesting. The last book that we'll show um, is this again, hand colored lithograph depicting a pink lady slipper. Let's look a little closer. So the pink lady slipper is native to North America. So many people are, many Americans are very familiar with this species and it is a favorite of many because of its sweet shape, looking like a little ballet slipper. This specific species was the inspiration for quite a few of the pieces that we will see um, in just a moment. And I will mention those specific ones, um, but kind of interesting that this one species where there are thousands of orchid species, but this one really has resonated with a few of our artists. So we'll take a look at our first piece, which was actually what we just focused on in our yoga class. This is Phalaenopsis Trader Joe's Exotica by David Willis. 
This is a very interesting work because it is a glass work, but it's really been treated more like a painting. David used tiny sand granules of glass called frit, like it was paint. And he laid down the color pixel by pixel to create an incredibly photorealistic image of this beautiful orchid. He used the fact that this glass has some translucency to his advantage. So we see on the petals where we see a little bit of um, almost like ombre color. We have some, some colors fading into one another. This was achieved through using translucent glass. The glass is able to capture quite a few tones and colors as it's layered up. If we look very close, you'll see that this is not just one very thin sheet of of glass that's been laid down, he's layering it up where he needs. So there are some areas that are a bit thicker than other if you're looking at it really from kind of the side. I have a video that David has um, very generously shared with us of his process, which is incredibly meticulous and time consuming. So here he is, he's sped this video up, but he has laid down an acrylic adhesive and now he's sprinkling down the little bits of glass frit with his fingers, sometimes with the tweezers, and then goes in with a paintbrush, very gently dabbing it to see what will grab onto the adhesive. This laborious process is almost meditative and reminds us of things like sand mandalas, where it's really the process, this very meditative process that is just as much the artwork as the finished piece. That, um, that piece by David Willis that I just spoke of is really worth coming and seeing in person if you have the ability to. We'll now be looking at three works, all by Brendan Baylor. Brendan Baylor is a printmaking professor here on campus at, the, at um, Old Dominion University. Let's take a closer look at his first work. This is Orchid House One. So here we have um, a few different methods of technique as far as printmaking. We have a screen printed inkjet print, layering down um, imagery one on another. We see that lush photography at the bottom is actually captured from within the Kaplan Conservatory here on campus. He's then layered other prints and, and drawings and things that he's done on top of that. So it's kind of print on top of print and then gone in at the end and laser engraved into that ink. So to create that barbed wire that we see, he's actually burned into the paper using a laser. This piece specifically is speaking about the different locations that orchids have all been extracted from, specifically for the Kaplan Conservatory. We can see the map is leading all the way up to Norfolk, Virginia. So here he's thinking about kind of the arbitrary nature of these borders that some things can pass through and others cannot. Thinking about the various places that we extract orchids from all over the world, maybe not even just orchids, thinking a little bit more broadly about extraction and colonialization and things of that nature. And maybe not necessarily having an opinion about it, but bringing it to our awareness that these species are not native to us. And so they have been taken from another place. Um, Orchid House 2 by Brendan Baylor, again, is a few layers of printmaking process, one on top of another, starting with, again, photography of the Kaplan Conservatory, and then laser engraving over that imagery. Let's take a closer look. So this piece uh, has kind of a similar tone, again, thinking about human and their interaction, their interaction with the natural world and the things, um, you know, the, the things that have happened because of that. So here we're speaking about global warming and we have this depiction of an iceberg over, again, imagery from the Kaplan. piece has very muted color palette and is really reflective, giving you just kind of a moment of pause, nothing too bombastic, something to take a moment and really look closely at. Um, the color palette is all very washed out. Um, and this piece was created specifically for this exhibition. Now, when I'm speaking about the various processes that happen and the laser engraving into the ink, I think it's really best represented in this piece. 
again by Brendan Baylor. So yes, we have the imagery from the Kaplan and over the top of that, we have um, a map and some other imagery laying over. Again, printmaking process upon printmaking process. But what makes this piece very interesting is this here that is being depicted, this very infertile land. It's actually being zoomed in on the map to show us this specific area in Central America. This image on the left, the, the very washed out farmland, was created again with a laser. So he laid down a lot of ink onto the paper and then extracted that ink, kind of scratched it away from the surface using a laser to create that image. Um, and it's kind of haunting look is really achieved by this very mechanical process. I find these works to be very interesting for quite a few reasons, but from a technical level, it's very interesting to see these very industrial processes being brought into fine art. We'll now move along to what I consider to be the showstopper of this whole exhibition. It really takes your attention, whether you'd like it or not. This is a wallpaper, a Victorian inspired wallpaper created entirely out of real insects, um, fibers and handmade paper, collected um, antiques and valuables and pasted um, vintage imagery. So we'll take a closer look, but this is an entire wall. So we're gonna kind of span the wall and then zoom in, but this piece really has a lot going on. So the camera is following the path of the grasshoppers that generously lead your eye around the space, allowing you to take in each little vignette depicting a various pollinator. This wallpaper we really consider to be a love letter to pollinators. Some of the vintage imagery that we'll zoom on in just a moment says things like a kindly remembrance and a token of affection, all sentiments that really resonate as symbiosis, win-win uh, for the plant and pollinator. These insects that we're seeing are all real insects that have been dried and preserved and are scientifically pinned to the wall so delicately I will say you can really inspect each insect and see that not a wing is missing, not an antenna. These have been incredibly lovingly installed onto the wall. The little vignettes, some of them have some dried orchids and others actually depict um, some handmade flowers. Um, Jennifer Angus, this artist, is a professor of textiles and fibers at the University of Wisconsin. We can see here with the buttons, and there's also another vignette depicting some straight pins that Jennifer has inserted these incredibly domestic materials kind of as her signature. So we can remember the artist that has made it. This little vignette is one of my favorites. We see a honeybee reading an orchid reference book, sort of a meta callback to where we started in the exhibition. This vignette depicts some birds as well as bees. Um, this is pointing at the fact that pollinators are a much larger group than just um, bees and things of that nature. It can be birds, it can sometimes be fungi, various critters, sometimes squirrels even, that are moving pollen from one area to another. Um, and some of the insects depicted in these vignettes are almost gilded. They have chrome wings or golden shells. None of these insects have been altered. So in a way, this work is also showcasing the natural artwork that's occurring in, in nature. This one here, like I said, we have that beautiful, almost gilded wing on these insects, but we also have some woven vanilla beans. And this is the first vignette that you walk upon when you walk into this space. So here Jennifer is really kind of rooting us within these orchids, reminding us that we might be more familiar with orchids than we think. Um, many of us have a bottle of vanilla in our baking cabinet. Vanilla is a species of orchid, something I was not aware of before this exhibition. This piece is really a method of collection and curation, as well as spontaneous installation. 
So most of this piece was mapped out beforehand, but the artist actually came and, and um, installed this work on her own um, in person. So there are some, some moments that kind of happened in the, in the space, things feeling like they needed. So we can see it like that the, the last vignette of the vanilla bean really spills onto that extra wall. That was not intentional. It just happened as installation was happening. Um, and speaking with Jennifer Angus, I had a question for her as to what happens to these insects after the installation. And she said that she actually has had some of these insects for over a decade. She reuses them for various installations. So that is why she's so delicate in the way that she installs and reinstalls them. Because at some point, the insect installation and will be reused in a, in a different form in a whole nother space to create a new piece of artwork. Um, something that I really find to be beautiful. So we're gonna stick along the realm of very soft materials, again, with some fibers and paper. We're looking at 21st century orchid vignette by Tiffany Turner. This is a gorgeous work that is really impeccable in its creation. So we see here two images of it from the side. This is a very weightless piece made entirely from German crepe paper, ribbon, and floral tape. So Tiffany Turner was once an architect, now turned full-time artist, and her attention to detail that I would think would come with the personality of somebody who's an architect, I think really shows through in her craftsmanship. And for that reason, we installed this piece in the round. People can come investigate it from all angles and they'll see that it is completely infallible. The piece is inspired by a 17th century woodcut, very similar to the images in the books that we looked at at the beginning. Um, but Tiffany wanted to modernize this piece a bit. So not only did she bring it to the third dimension, but she brought some references into the piece that are really of this moment. This work was created during the pandemic, during lockdown and quarantine in 2020. So she's loaded it up with symbolism of how she was feeling. We see the blooms that are dyed blue at the top of the bouquet. This is kind of a commentary on the various lengths that we all go to for beauty. We see the bud that's been snipped and is now wilted and dying. This is thinking about the fact that hope does not always spring eternal and that some movements and thoughts should and need to come to an end. The whole piece in itself is really thinking about death and decay and finding beauty in its inevitability. This piece is, is saying a lot in a very gentle statement. And a very interesting note about this work is that because it is so weightless in its materials, it's actually not sitting on any sort of a stand or it's suspended. It is floating on its roots. So at the bottom, you can see there's about five or six roots emerging from the bottom. We have delicately balanced this piece so that it is just sitting almost weightlessly floating on the pedestal. We're now gonna move away from very soft materials and into glass. This, we have now uh, about seven paperweights by Paul Stankard. He is really known for his botanical paperweights, specifically orchids in many cases. And so let's take a look at some of these works. The first two that we are showing are some gorgeous paperweights depicting orchids on a blue background. So here he's using glass color, again, thinking about it almost in a painterly sense of wanting to really have some nice contrast to the gorgeous petals of the orchid. We see a pink lady slipper depicted as well. We have some traditional paperweights here where it looks like the flowers are just floating in water or in you know, clear nothingness. This is completely made of glass. And then we have two spears. So whereas the first few paperweights that we looked at would be traditional paperweights. So they're domed on the top and flat on the bottom and they would sit flat on a table. Really 
the traditional way of a paperweight to sit and actually hold paper down. Of course, they are often not used for that, but they follow that same structure. But the other two pieces that Paul has are spheres. Um, and these are made in an incredible way. He basically makes two paperweights and butts them up together while they're hot and kind of rounds it out into a perfect sphere. We actually have a video um, where he demystifies his process. So why don't we take a look at that? And the narrowest tinge of my hand puts to scorn all machinery. This sentence is from one of Walt Whitman's most respected poems, Song of Myself. I'm Paul Stankett. I'd like to share with you the process and techniques that I have both perfected and developed. These techniques have enabled me to create this glass orb that I have titled Orchid Bouquet Cluster. The process that I use to create my botanical art, it's called flame working. And here I'm taking commercially available colored glasses, melting them into what I call material preparation. Here I'm making the green glass rods to press out leaves for the design. When I'm focusing on a blossom, I take advantage of colored glasses rolled into powder glasses, and that gives me a variety of shades. If you recall, the frit that he's rolling into is just the same frit that David Willis used for his glass on canvas. This would be the Here more I'm traditional way to use it. I'm taking the lip of the blossom and sealing steeples and petals onto the lip. And by heating the petals, and shaping it, I'm developing a paphiopetalum orchid. Once the I have the detail. blossom finished, I put it in an annealing oven and anneal it at 975 Fahrenheit so that it becomes stable. When I flame worked all the components, I bring them to the hot plate on my bench and by keeping it hot with a Bunsen burner underneath, I attach the botanical components into the design. Once the components are finished into a design, I bring it to a pickup oven where it is going to be encapsulated in clear glass. My assistant is preheating clear glass to be dropped onto the colored glass design and encapsulate the orchids. We repeat the process with two halves sealed together and shaping it into the final orb. In the studio, I take advantage of two heat sources, the glorio and the gas oxygen bench burner. The heat involved is upwards of 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, shaping the glass into a sphere. By putting two halves together, I'm able to suggest the design is 360 degrees. Magnification plays an important role in the presentation of the design. Once the orb is shaped, it goes into the oven to anneal for 40 hours. Once the glass is annealed, it's then ground and polished to be finished. So beautifully, this exact sphere is one that we show in the gallery. So you can watch the video depicting how the piece is made and then really explore it for yourself. Oh, but I, I unfortunately didn't include a picture of that exact one, but you saw it in the video. Um, so Paul is really a beloved artist, and he has been working in glass art uh, since the 1970s, really since glass came to America. And at this point, his name is really synonymous with botanical paperweights. 
He lives and works in Salem, New Jersey and at the um, Salem Community College. If you'd like to meet him or watch him um, work live, he is always teaching students there and would be happy to show you his process. We're now gonna look at another glass artist. This is Deborah Moore, and this is her Pink Lady Slipper Orchid. So let's take a closer look at the piece itself. It's actually two separate pieces, both, depic both depicting a Pink Lady Slipper. Um, Deborah Moore, it works in glass slightly different than Paul Stankard. So we saw in that video that Paul does flame marking. So he's creating his works on a very small flame um, using an ultra, ultra hot flame. And here, Deborah Moore is actually using the hot shop. So if you've been somewhere to see live glass blowing, you know, they're sitting at a bench, they're working horizontally. This would be how she makes her works. So Deborah is very inspired by the beauty of organic um, nature and orchids. And she likes to play scientists a little bit when it comes to the color palette. So we see some very photorealistic looking orchids on bamboo, but she's taken some artistic liberty here with the way that she creates the species um, in their color and texture and patterning. Deborah Moore is an incredible artist. She was actually the first woman of color to go study on the island of Murano and get to learn under the masters in Italy. She then brought that knowledge back to America and she lives and teaches in Seattle, Washington, where she has her own glass blowing studio. She too, at this point, has really built her career around glass orchids. And when people speak of her artwork, they're speaking about glass orchids specifically. Now, sometimes her scale changes. She'll work sometimes a little smaller, sometimes larger, often these wall pieces, but sometimes makes very large scale installations where the orchids are just as big as a person. Her work is incredible and really worth seeing in person. The texture that she builds up with glass powder is you would not believe that you're seeing glass. All right, so we're gonna move away now from glass and speak about Brett de Windham and her Tropicalian diptych. So this piece is a cyanotype, would be um, the material or the process. So cyanotypes are a pretty well-known scientific and artistic process. They, in, they um, include painting a photosensitive solution onto a piece of paper. Here it's that very dark blue. And then the artist purchased and dried an orchid. So here, very similar to how David Willis poked fun at the Trader Joe's orchid that he depicted, Brett Windham specifically bought her orchid from Home Depot and wanted that to be kind of known in in it, and when we're speaking about the label and, and how it was made, she's created fine art from a very ubiquitous plant that she was able to find just about anywhere. So she purchased the plant, she pressed and dried it, and then she laid it on this photosensitive paper and put it out in the sun. This is a very standard process. When she brought it back in, the whole outline of the orchid would have been completely bleached. So everywhere that there's the shadow, is bleached by the sun. Um, this process in itself is an ode to Anna Atkins, an artist who popularized this process probably in about the 50s. So Brett here now is modernizing this process and really making it her own with the incorporation of beautiful watercolors. So she has, again, very similar to Deborah Moore, taken some artistic liberties to create a species of her own. We have some fantastic kind of zebra striped roots and she's taken some liberties in creating the speckled splotched petals and the striped leaves, really creating just a fun tropical species out of her mind. 
Um, so something interesting about Brett Wyndham is that she's continuing this process of cyanotypes. She's really built her whole process, her artistic process around it. So she's now exploring ways of doing the same photosensitive process on fabric instead of paper. And then instead of watercolor painting, she's embroidering color into it. So it's very interesting to see the way that this process has been adapted um, through all various materials um, throughout time. It's kind of interesting to watch. Alrighty, so the last three artists that I will speak about uh, are all what I would consider to be more of conceptual contemporary artists. They're not necessarily staying in one lane when it comes to technique or medium. They might be very um, invested in a specific research or um, topic like Callista Leon is very interested in ecology, but the way that her artwork actually is manifested is not always the same. She's kind of all over the place. And this way of working is very common for many artists these days. So this is interspecies intimacies, and this is actually some fired, um, some bisque fired wares, um, so ceramic and then has been underglazed and also painted. And so the way that she treats the, the surface of this material really give the pieces almost a Play-Doh-like look. And so they have a very childish feel to them as well as their very whimsical shapes. So let's take a closer look. So this work was inspired by, again, about a 17th century woodcut. And that woodcut was depicting an orchid that has been, um, dissected down to its internal organs. And the organs look kind of crazy, just like human organs. And so she took that as inspiration, the shapes, um, to create her own whole army of various orchid organs or plant organs. Again, we have artists playing scientist, where we have not only some kind of realistic-ish looking organs from the orchid, but certainly taking note from some human anatomy and other various um, familiar forms. Um, and then also maybe even something like Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. We have this kind of monster feel happening. And I think that's played up by the scale. These are certainly not realistic to the scale that they would be if they were organs in a plant or organs in a human. Each of these pieces sits probably about eight inches tall, some all the way up to about maybe 12 to 14 inches tall. So they're at this very peculiar scale. When you see them in the space, they're just a little below eye level. So you can really kind of get close and investigate them, um, but they're, just peculiar, silly little uh, works, kind of one after another, um, and put on this shelf so that you can walk through the space and kind of look at them at your own pace. This one here in the middle really reminds me of a kiwi bird. So it's kind of fun to just sit and very similar to if you look up at the clouds and you, you know, see things that, that, you know, look a certain way. In the same way, you might start to see things within these creatures. Um, we're just about to come upon one that I think has sort of a sweet little story to it. Here again, we have some more monster-like ones with these long phalanges. Okay, so this one that's just about to be in the center of the screen, what we see emerging out of this small little piece are actually some tufts of the artist's dog's fur. A way of, again, kind of inserting a fingerprint into this artwork that there's kind of, there's literal DNA of from within this family. Um, so really kind of the artist is showing their hand here. We're not in the realm of abstract expressionism anymore where we're trying to hide the artist's hand. We're really showcasing it in many ways. These certainly look very handmade, but there are little moments that really link this back to being a very human piece of artwork. Now we have another piece by Callista that is called Becoming With. So as I had mentioned, her works span various materials and thoughts and processes. 
So whereas the last work by Callista was kind of a playful thought about orchids and creating things that made you feel like you were looking at some sort of a plant or something to do with nature. Here we have the artist using their own body now and, and being inspired by these shapes and lines that they see. So let's take a closer look. We've got some interesting prints that have a little bit of a kind of a haunting quality to them. These were created by putting a hand over a scanner and kind of slowly moving as the scanner scans. In many of these, you'll see that the hand has much more than five fingers on it. So we can see that there's some movement happening. She's depicting the various shapes and lines she sees in nature. She herself is an organic being and using her own hands and body to depict other organic beings. A note that I like really about this piece is the dirt under the fingernails. There's just another element of humanity within this piece. And certainly the piece on the left, I definitely see a little orchid bloom. The others get to be a little bit more abstract, start to even almost remind me of something more like a horror movie, um, but they really draw you in with, this, with the motion and the shape, thinking about the way she's contorting her hand. We will next look at Roxana Azar, again, a very contemporary artist who's doing all sorts of various things. So we'll first take a look at some photography from Roxana. This is from within the greenhouse um, and just some gorgeous um, photography. And the reason that we'll show you this is because the next piece is actually entirely layered up of those images. So this is their piece, Orchid Eclipse. And this is Lucite that has been developed with NASA and on it are layer upon layer of those images, kind of layered one upon another, abstracting it a bit. You can't necessarily see the one specific orchid, but you know you're looking at almost an endless field of orchids. Like I said, this Lucite was developed with NASA, so it has some pretty high tech um, capabilities. So it actually filters out UV rays. So as the light streams through, we can see those zany colored shadows behind. And that is because of the process that's happening of filtration. We get some yellows and reds casting upon the wall, almost a projection happening. This piece really is one to be seen in person because if you fix your eyes on the work, it's sort of holographic quality allows it to shift colors. So I'll often have viewers take a look at the piece and then walk themselves around the space. They'll see the colors change from hot pink to lime green, orange and yellow. From some angles, you can really see the photo imagery from within and in others, you can't see anything. Um, it's kind of a, a magical piece and it's really an ode to many artists that came before Roxana. The cutout, um, of the Lucite and kind of hanging the two on the wall is certainly an ode to Matisse, the painter. Um, but generally, there's an ode to many forms of artwork and, and um, just thinking about the beauty from within nature. Um, and the inspiration, um, this is not an exact quote, but it's something just like this. They said the inspiration for this piece was a disco in a greenhouse. And I would certainly say that that mission was achieved because that is exactly what I'm getting from this. So the last piece that we will look at are two works by Natalia Kent. So the first piece here that we are showing is Natalia Kent's photography, really as a commercial photographer. So Harvard um, asked Natalia to take some photos of these beautiful glass specimens that they have in their botany library. They, in the early 1900s, asked Czech Republic um, father and son duo to come over and they're called the Balashkas, to come over and to create these specimens out of glass so that their students could study the works in this very photorealistic way. 
So this process would have been very similar to Paul Stankard using a flame, flame working to create very small and detailed works. Well, these pieces are now just about priceless and incredibly fragile. And so they really don't leave uh, Boston. Um, but, um, but Harvard um, commissioned Natalia to come out and take some photos of the works. And so, like I said, some of these works are incredibly small. And so she would have to set the piece down in front of her and drape herself in a big black curtain and take a picture of the piece in complete stillness in order to get the work in focus. And I think that's very interesting then when we look at some work, some of her personal work then that we also have in the show, which was created through movement. So whereas those other, those works, those compositions that she created depicting the beautiful glass specimens were created in stillness, although they certainly depict some movement. This piece required movement to create it. Um, so we've got here movement artifact. So this is a large piece of photographic paper or photosensitive paper that has been put into the dark room and Natalia uses a light source streaming through some sort of almost like a stencil or a shape. In this case, I believe it would be something like a rectangle or a square shape. And so she lets the light filter just through that that shape. And then she moves her body around the space, changing where the light filters onto the paper, dancing, spinning around, singing and screaming. She creates this piece with her, with the movement of her body. Before she goes into the dark room, she sets her intentions and her parameters of what she's creating. But then she goes in and moves around. And what we end up with is almost kind of a flight map of her movements in the space. We can kind of follow it around the whole composition from corner to corner, sort of watching her movements. Um, so this is an interesting work for that reason. Um, it's our most abstract work in our orchid show. Um, but again, we're thinking about contemporary artists and the way that they are depicting orchids, which is not necessarily in this very representational way, but sometimes really just does come down to intention. So that is the final work that I have to show you of the orchid exhibition. I hope you all enjoyed and learned something new. And if you live in this area, I highly recommend coming out to check it out in person. The show is only up for a few more days, it comes down, <coughs> excuse me, it comes down on August 2nd. So you have until August 1st to come check out the show in person and explore the beauty for what it really is. So the tour aspect of our time together is finished, but we will now be moving on to a uh, um, some orchid gami, so a little project that we can work on um, now that we've gotten to dig into the exhibition a bit. So I am going to drop a link into the chat, which has a, a web page that you can print out if you're interested in following along. So just give me one second to pull that up. And is this something, while you're pulling that up, is this something that we can actually do at home with even printer paper or anything else, right? Yes. So I tried it myself because this orchid gami is best if you have some slightly thicker paper, but I wanted to see if we could have this be as accessible as possible. And I found that I had reasonable success using printer paper. I don't even myself have a colored printer. So I actually hand colored all of the petals wow. <laughs> and I think that it worked out just fine. So if you even if you just have a black and white printer at home, I encourage you to please follow along with this. So I'm going to drop it into the chat right now. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And so let us know what you would like us to do with this link that you just sent in the chat. Yes. 
So if you'd like to click on the link, it's going to bring you up to an awesome website from the North American Orchid Center, which generally I just recommend taking some time to take a look at yourself. Um, and they have so generously created Orchid Gami so that the world can get a closer look at the intricacies of Orchid and kind of fashion it themselves. So if you would like to follow along, just click on the link and print this page. You're going to want to print it on both sides. So just make sure when you click print that you click that little box so that it prints on both sides and you will end up with a page that looks like this. And like I said, I only printed it in black and white and I think that's just fine because now that we've seen some of the ways that our artists have taken their own artistic liberties to create their own species of orchids, we can do the same. So the website depicts this orchid as an orange, as an orange fringed orchid. But like I said, you can make it however you'd like as far as colors. So once you have things printed out, and I'll give you a few moments, you're gonna to need to assemble a few supplies for yourself. So why don't we get our station set up before we get started with instructions? So you'll certainly want one copy of the orchid that I printed out. This is level two on their scale between one and five. If you find that you like this process, I recommend checking out the website and finding maybe some that are a little bit trickier. I thought we'd start a little on the easier side and it's certainly not the easiest even. And that scale is one as easiest and five as hardest. Gotcha. Yes. Yep. And this is a two. So you'll have your paper. You're certainly going to need some scissors, some glue or tape would be fine. Glue might be preferred though. And then if you did print your um, image in black and white, you might also grab some pens, colored pencils, crayons, whatever you've got around to bring a little life to your orchid, to give it some color, to give it some patterning. And I believe that's all you need. It's pretty simple. So um, we're actually going to just follow along right along with the instructions that have been generously provided from the Orchid Center. So before we get started, I'll just read about this orchid that I selected. And I chose this one because it's a little bit different maybe than what we think of an orchid to look like. Um, doesn't have that necessarily traditional like pink lady slipper. This is the fringed orchid. And it really reminded me of one of those first orchids in the book that we all took a look at, the orange fringed bog orchid. But this is actually something slightly different. So I'll read. Chapman's fringed orchid grows in open wet areas on the southern southeastern coastal plain, primarily in Florida, but a few populations grow in Texas and Georgia. It's often found along roadsides and ditches. Maintenance activities such as mowing, spraying herbicide and spraying herbicides threaten the survival of this rare orchid. The bright orange flower attracts the swallowtail butterfly, which uses its long tongue to probe the fl flower spur for nectar. Sticky pollen attaches to the tongue and is transferred to the stigma of the next flower it visits. These butterfly pollinators carry pollen great distances, but require suitable habitat corridors that connect one remote orchid population to the next. So why don't we go ahead and get started by coloring in our image. If you've printed it in color, you can feel free to maybe add some embellishments to make this orchid your own. Um, and if you do decide to color it, remember that we are going to be cutting out these pieces. So you don't really need to stay inside the lines for the sake of time. Go ahead and just kind of color over it because we're going to cut it out on its lines and nobody will know if you didn't color in the lines. So I'll give us about five minutes to get some coloring done. And 
So at around 1132 or so, we will start the cutting and then the folding process. But I wanna give you a few minutes. If you do want to color it, you can certainly do that. I've found that it's a lot easier to color it, obviously, before we start cutting, folding, and gluing it. Um, but if, if you want, just for the sake of time, also to just start it black and white and then try to paint or color it afterwards, you can certainly do that. Um, I think you could have some fun. Like I said earlier, we're, we're probably using colored pencils or crayons or something like that. But if later you wanted to take it up even a, another notch, we could incorporate some paint, like some oil paints onto this to really give it kind of a third dimension and maybe a little bit of texture, maybe some glitter. I always love to add a little glitter. Um, so, you know, as we learned in the orchid exhibition, we can be inspired by these beautiful um, meticulous things that occur in nature that have so much scientific and artistic relevance, but we don't have to follow by the rules when we're coming to um, creativity. So if you want to make it yours, to put your signature on it, similar to how many of the artists put their signature on what they created, go right ahead. I think it's great if it doesn't look like you purchased it at a store. It's, it's wonderful to see the artist's hand within what they're making. I'm going to stop talking for just a second and start coloring. Like I said, you don't have to color in the lines. We're just going to cut it out anyway. So I did my first orchid pretty similarly to how it's depicted online, the orange fringe. This time I'm gonna be inspired by Brett Windham and her Tropicalian diptych. And I'm gonna create something with some more jewel and ocean tones. So we're gonna go with some greens and some blues, have a little fun with it. We can get inspired by David Willis and his um, consideration of sort of blending colors, especially if you're using something like a colored pencil. They're great for blending because they require so much coloring to get every white spot. So maybe you go over and you have some white spots and you come in with another color. And that really creates a very similar effect to using the translucent glass. In a way, the way that the colored pencil writes on paper is a bit translucent almost. We can, we can still see some of the white paper through it. And you can sort of use the fact that your black and white printer is still going to show some of the gradients. You can use that to help you. So you might notice that there's some areas that are much darker. Um, one area specifically, the bottom of this little almost kind of tulip shape, this bottom I know was green online. So whether you color your whole thing whatever color you decide, maybe this little, which kind of becomes the stem, you do as a contrasting color. And I'll show you in my physical orchid. So we've got kind of the oranges and things, but under here, there's the green. And that is that section that I just showed. Not staying in the lines at all. <laughs> it's 
been a while since I've done something like this. There's something very meditative about taking some time. I've almost considered this um, self-care, taking some time, letting your mind wander a little bit and doing something with your hands, whether that's going outside and gardening real plants, taking some time to color some plants, taking some time to do some yoga inspired by plants. It's just such a gorgeous part of this world are the beautiful specimens that we get to see. And it's easy to take them for granted. Um, and I think this exhibition really took a moment to showcase that there's so much beauty in nature and that it is such a source of inspiration. So you'll see while you're coloring that there are some bold lines or some solid black lines, as well as some dashed or dotted lines. Pay attention to those. It's okay if you color over them, but later in a few minutes, as we get started with the folding and cutting, those lines will be relevant. We're gonna be cutting on all of the solid line. And we're going to be folding on the dotted lines. And remember, there's a front and a back. So although we'll be getting the instructions about cutting and folding on the front side, you'll still wanna color the back side, unless you don't. And that's an artistic choice of its own and that's just fine. Okay, so for the sake of time, I am gonna choose the artistic choice of not coloring the back. So why don't we go ahead and get started cutting? So I'm gonna cut and I'll show you um, as I do each piece, but essentially we have four separate pieces here. We've got the long piece in the middle, two, three. If even if you didn't color this, this is still a piece to cut out. This is the stand and then four. When we see in the orchid, we have one, two, three, and four. So like I said, we're cutting on the solid line and take your time. It's some kind of precise cutting to go around each bend and each line. I'm gonna start with um, my base specifically. So if you'd like to follow along with me, feel free. You can otherwise do it at your own pace. But I'm gonna cut all of the solid lines. So I'll first cut the shape around it. And then this one is interesting because there's a slight little solid line going into this little square in the middle and then around. So I'm gonna use my scissors to cut in and then around removing this little white square in the middle. So I'm removing A. So 
So I've removed A, and this part right here is cut to move. Okay, and then right below where the square was, where that A was, we see another very small solid line. We're gonna cut that. And I think a great way to cut it would be to fold your piece kind of gently in half. You don't have to fully crease it. And you're gonna use your scissors and snip. Similar to if you're doing a snowflake. So I just snipped and now I have a little slit right there. I can open it back up. And this has just got a little slit in it. So I'm gonna follow the dotted lines now. I've got a few diagonal dotted lines that I'll be folding. You're gonna fold it back on itself. So now I, so I folded down that side, fold down the other sides. And you'll see once it's folded, we're making kind of a nice triangle pyramid sort of thing. We are going to put some glue on this little white tab here. If you don't have glue, you can tape or glue dots, whatever you've got. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a little glue. But if you, if you fold it correctly, the little image that's been printed out will continue. Put a little glue, just a dot, don't need too much. And we'll fold it. And there's our stand. So I'm gonna set this aside, let that glue dry a little bit. And I'm gonna next cut out the part that has the bit of stem. So this kind of tulip shape, I'll cut that one up next. Lots of curves on this one, but this is just getting us ready for the most challenging one to cut, which we'll do in just a minute. Like I said, this is level two. I thought they can handle more than level one. Mm. Okay, so I've cut the outside of mine just about all the way out. So again, just like the stand, there are some little cuts or slits to cut out. So any solid lines you see are gonna be a little cut. So once you cut out the outside, go ahead and do some of these cuts. So the one is not even really a slit. You can just go right in with your scissors and cut kind of that L or that kind of backward seven shape allows this top to move. And remember that this was designed to be using a little bit thicker cardstock. So if you find that you're having a slightly uh, difficult time, just remember that 
this is, we've put a little extra challenge on you. So the only thing really to consider since we're using slightly thinner paper is just to be a little bit more delicate with the paper. Um, and if it rips, you can go ahead and tape it or print yourself a new one. Um, but we're here just to have some fun, no pressure. So on the ones where the little cut is on the inside, you'll do kind of another technique where you fold it kind of on the halfway point and just use your scissors to cut just that edge. Okay. Oh, and I see one more little slit. And then you will see at the bottom of this one, down here, there are some dotted lines. We're gonna be folding it. Let me show you on the one I finished. I'll disassemble this one a little bit. So this one I have folded on all of the lines and it has created kind of a three-dimensional stem with almost like a little pocket on the top. And eventually we'll be sticking some things down into here. So we fold it on the lines and we glue. So I've folded and now the little tab, the little edge that's coming out, that kind of rounded tab will fit right into the slit that you've cut. And for good measure, I'd put a little glue on it. So get that nice and closed up. Takes a little finagling, especially with that very delicate paper. A little glue, we'll push it down. And again, we'll let this one dry for a few seconds because this one's gonna be holding kind of the brunt of the weight. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna set this one aside and let's cut out the last two pieces. And actually, for the sake of time, I'm going to do the cooking show magic and have one magically cut out, uh, just so we can keep moving along. But this is going to take you the longest amount of time to cut out. Obviously, it's got a lot of little um, limbs coming off of it, little petal fringes, uh, but it's worth taking your time to make them nice. And what we're going to do with this one once it's cut out is we see that there's a dotted line on the back. We're gonna fold it, but we're not folding it all the way down. This bottom part can stay kind of limp. We're just folding from this little arrow down. Just gives it that kind of nice like palm frond. It holds its shape a little bit better when it has that spine or that structure holding it. So we've got piece number one, that we folded. The next thing we can do is take a pencil or something round and kind of curl up the end of the frond. Curling that around a pencil. Okay, so that's a little curled tail. We've cut out now the last shape and you will fold it down the middle, folding it in half. And you'll also fold down the little edges. 
and we'll get a nice three-dimensional shape. So we've got our four pieces. I'm gonna start with my um, stand. And the first thing that we will insert is the, well, we'll start, let's start with this one. And you're gonna insert it inside of your stand. Hopefully it's kind of um, a snug fit and it wants to stand up nice and straight. <coughs> Excuse me. If not, you can do a little secret taping on the bottom or whatever you need to do to get it to stand up. We've got our piece here. The next piece that we will insert is the beautiful frond. And that is going to actually thread through the bottom, thread through. So you're gonna grab the tail, you're gonna thread it through this and push, push, push it through until it comes out of the bottom of the stand. And you might have to gently fold it like the long way to get it to fit. Just be gentle with it. Here we go. So it's come out of the bottom now, I can pull it. And I've got a little extra down there, that's fine. We'll deal with that at the end. And Lastly, the little last piece. And that is just gonna stuff right down in between the two. Now, the last thing that I did to kind of secure things is I folded up and earlier we had rolled it up. So whatever method you'd like to do, just to clean up that bottom a little bit and, I, and rolling it or folding it is also gonna prevent it from wanting to slide out. So use my pencil, roll it up. Mm hmm And here we have it. A beautiful Chapman fringed orchid. So like I said, this website has many species of orchids. You could make a whole bouquet or collection of them. They have the label of what they are named right on there. So you can make yourself a little display and learn the various species. Each instruction sheet also has some information about the orchids, which I think is great to get some specific information because there are over 2,500 species of orchids, so many, and each one has specific qualities and care. It lives in specific regions. Some are endangered, some are everywhere. So it's interesting to get the facts about each one and each looks so different. So I hope you enjoyed learning some orchid gami. I hope you use this resource um, in the future and share it with others. And if you are interested in the Berry Art Museum collection, I highly recommend coming in person, checking us out. If you are somewhere and you are not in Virginia and able to come check us out, we have a bunch of online um, programming. We have multimedia tours similar to this. We have a virtual tour where you can sort of like a Google Streets or Google Maps where you can sort of push your way through the museum virtually. We have lectures, we have the, the yoga that we started with. 
many ways to engage with the Barry Art Museum collection online or in person. We'd be happy to see you. And we're so happy that you were here to join us today. So thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions or anything for me? Well, that was really wonderful, Suzanne. We really appreciate you joining the Reyes program today. And so on behalf of Old Dominion University and the Reyes program planning team, I would like to thank Suzanne one more time for joining us and showing us how to make a Platanthera Chapmani Orchid Gami. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Nice job. <laughs> And to our audience, thank you again for tuning in. We look forward to not only completing this orchid, but also the bouquet that you suggested. So again, if you follow the link that was presented, then you can go ahead and, and follow through on this. For those of you that are watching us on YouTube, we'll be happy to share the URL on the session on our calendar so that you have that to follow along. And so we look forward to you joining our next session, which is today at 1 p.m., where you will learn about the fundamentals of engineering Today's session has been recorded, and if you'd like to watch it again, I know that I will be, or share it with friends, you can access it from our YouTube channel, which is linked from the Reyes website at odu.edu slash Reyes. This concludes our session, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you right here at the next session at 1 p.m. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Suzanne. That was really wonderful. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.